European Union delegation to Mongolia is very happy to participate in the Nogon Butter project. Nogon Butter project basically put together uh, uh, many partners to raise awareness about air pollution and uh, also to change lifestyles of persons towards a less polluting mode. In Mongolia, we have a small but very lively European community. Besides the European embassies present in Ulaanbaatar, there are two cultural institutes, the Alliance Française and the Goethe Institute. The unique call for project ideas, called European Spaces of Culture, required the participation of three European partners, the EU delegation and Mongolian organizations. For us in Ulaanbaatar, this unique call was a great chance to intensify and strengthen European cultural cooperation and the already existing collaboration with our Mongolian partners. I am very pleased that the Czech Embassy to Mongolia has become one of the three partners who applied for a unique project. And uh, uh, together with Alliance Française and Goethe Institute, we became successful with our application for the Nogon Batar Street Art Festival. And uh, that is why we are able to involve two uh, renowned Czech artists. One of them is Itka Kopetkova, the other is David Strauss, who are also well known in the street art. Cultural activities organized by Goethe Institute and Alliance Française usually take place in the center of Ulaanbaatar. But as we really wanted this uh, Ulaanbaatar Eco Art Festival to answer the needs of uh, the capital uh, of Mongolia, we decided to go in the Gare district. And uh, we especially uh, targeted a very nice and accurate place called Ulaanbaatar. I was lucky enough to start working with Ulaanbaatar in 2019, before the pandemic actually started, so I could go to Ulaanbaatar and work with the team in person. And my role in the Nogan Batar project was to help with the planning and strategy of the festival and to host workshops um, for idea generation of the festival formats. I was very impressed uh, by, the, by the good spirit in the team and among all the group of people, all the artists, and the dedication to collaborate and to cooperate in order to make the project a great project. Ногон батар төслийн хүрээнд дулаан шинжилт төслийн мэрэгсэн баригадууд ногоон нүүр цэцэрлэгт хүрээлэнгийн байшинг стандартын дагавууд улаалсан. Дулаан шинжилт төсөл нь 2018 оноос 2021 онд хэрэгжиж байгаа гэр хорооллын хувийн суудлыг дулааснаар мөн дулаан алдагдлыг багсгаснаар агаарын бохирдлыг бууруулахад хувь нэмрээ оруулах зорилготой төсөл дулаан шийдэл төслийг жирэс олуулсын төрийн бус байгууллага шүтээсэн дэргэдэх барилгын эрчим хүчний нэмэлтийн төв Монголын барилгын үндэсний ассоцияц болон пиплиний долуулсын төрийн бус байгууллага хамтарч хэрэгжүүлдэг Монголын урлагийн зөвлийн хамт болон Ногон Батар эко надмын хамтрагчаар ажиллахдаа таатай байгаа. За манай байгууллагын хувьд агаарын бох хөртлийн хор үшгийг хөөх залуучуудад танилцуулах Ногон Батар надмын хүрээнд гар зургийн уралдааныг бол гэр хорооллын цахийн хорооллын хөөхтүүдийн дунд бол зарласан байгаа. Ингээд энэ хүн надмын хүрээнд нийт 111 бүтээлийг бид одоогийн байдлаар бол хүлээж аваад нийт 3000 гаруй хүнд хүрсэн. Долон дүүргийн 35 хороодын байл өрхөд бол энэ хүү төслөөр хүрч ажилласан юм өөр дүнтэй байна. За тэгээд наадам чалгарсан 20 шилдэг одоо бүтээлийг бид нэр шүгштийн зүгээс шалгуулаад нийт хөөхтүүдтэй шагналын гард уулахад одоо бэлэн болсон байгаа. Энэ ногон батрын одоо хөтөслөл бол маш их амжилттай бол одоо өнөөдөр явагдаж байна. Тэгээд энэ төслийн хүрээнд бол манай залуу оюутнууд те багш герман багшнаар багшаар бол юу зал гэсэн гэхээр энэ агаарын бох хөтөлтөө те яаж тэмцгээ зөвөр агаар одоо энэ ирээдүйд дэлхийд одоо ямар хэрэгтэй энэ тал дээр бол манай оюутнууд бол нэлээ одоо багш нартайгаа те урд уран бүтээлчийн хувьд бол олон зүйл төр бол ярьсан байгаа. Тэгээд ер нь одоо бас өнөөдөр Монголын залуучууд бас өөрийнхөө одоо эзэмшиж байгаа мэржлэрээ те Монголын нийтэнд дуу хоолойгоо одоо оруулсан гэдэг бол маш их чухал юм байгаа. I was asked to do an illustration workshop with the students of the University of Art. 
and also in col collaboration with Monsuda Publishing. We had some input sessions where we talked about the development and the working procedure and technique, and we had several outstanding books of other illustrators. We had a look at, in the practical part of the workshop, the students worked on a poster which had to deal with air pollution. The students were supposed to create an illustration and to think about how to combine the illustration with text to make a poster out of it. So now, work is done. It was challenging to do it online, but we succeeded. We laughed, we discussed, we did illustrations, and there will be a little competition. And I'm curious who of the students will get some of the poster prizes. Hi, my name is Cez. I'm a urban artist from Paris, France. I'm traveling a lot all over the world to paint big murals and to do a project with local population. I also have a, a, a work inside in my studio, uh, painting canvases, making sculpture, preparing installation. And I try to work outside in the streets and also inside in museum, galleries or foundation. So I'm being very glad to participate to the Nogun Bator Eco Festival. Uh, it was such a good experience because I've seen incredible uh, work with different media. Hello everyone in Ulaanbaatar and everyone involved in the Nogun Batar Eco Festival. My name is David Strauss. I was uh, involved in uh, a virtual meeting with, with artists that um, were interested in street art. I'm excited to see what the results are from the festival and from some of the other artists from France and Germany who are, are participating, including Yitka Kopetkova. Ulaanbaatar hoti hiroorasiin wataamji 
энэ төсөл маань одоо өнгөлөг гэгээлэг оршин суугчтай бас өрөөлөн дуудаж одоо амьдрах хурчно Улаанбаатар хотын нэг ихэн бас нэг сайхан гудамж болох тийм төсөл байх гэдэг би оролцож байгаа. Гэр оруулахын бас энэ гудамж их сайхан болох гэсэн бодол сэтгэл их байд юм байна. Олон хүмүүс ирж уулзчих юм. Та нөхөд одоо ямар хуу хүтэл хийгээд байгаа юм бэ? Ямар зураг зураад байгаа юм бэ? Хаанаас явах бэ гэж их асууж байна. Аа яг энэ төсөл маань бол их өгөөчтэй төсөл байна. Энэ төсөл бодлохоор яг өөрөө бидэг арга онцоор нэг гадаа орон цаг төсөөрөж байна. Нэгст мэдгээр ажилласан төсөл тавьж байгаа. Энэ нь болохоор тухайн орчинд бас ийрэгнээс ч өгч юм те. Одоо нэг матрацын юм нэг сөөрн бодоо бас хүмүүс өөрөө харах юм те. Одоо санаага санагдаж юм энэ ажлаа цуурд ажиллаж хийж байгаа. Одоо энэ цуурд ажиллаад маань болохоор айлын хашаанд дээр нь шиг байрлах юм. Ногоон баатар эко стволын гол санаа нь бол одоо улгаар төрсөг улгаар дамжуулж олон нийтэд эрэг хандлагыг төгөөх а мөн одоо орчны бохотлт агаарын бохотлт орчны бохотлыг бас уурлах а гээд одоо гэр хорооллын орчныг одоо сайжруулж төрсгөлийн бүтээлүүд дээр одоо чимэглэх ийм зөвлөл нь надад маш их таалдаг би энэ фестивалд оролцсон гэсэн хүсэлтэй өгсөн тэгээд энэ фестивалд оролцож байгаа миний бүтээл нь одоо керамик жижигэн баримтлууд а энэ бол тагтаа шуурнууд байгаа. За тагтаа шуу бол тагтаа нь бол маш эртний одоо эртнээс өөрөө 58 жилийн өмнөөс одоо цэвэр ариуны бэлгэдэл гэж одоо үзэж ирсэн юм шуу юм байна. За ногоон батар эко арт фестивал одоо оролцож байгаа миний бүтээлийн хувьд яг одоо энэ аргуулгынхаа хүрээнд эко гэсэн аргуулгынхаа хүрээнд хаягдлын материал ашиглаж хийж байгаагаар их онцлогтой миний бүтээлийн гэсэн гол санаа нэг хэм бол өнгөрсөн хэм байсан чухал биш ирээдүйд хэм байх нь чухал гэдэг санааг ихшүүлж байгаа юм. Тэгэхээр хог хаягдлж гэсэн юм хэрэгцээ шаардлага хангахгүй одоо байгаль орчны бүхэлдүүдад байжс байсан зүйл одоо дотор төгөлдөр урлагийн бүтээл болж болохыг энэ одоо кактусыг дүрсэлж идэрхийлээд байгаа юм. Гэр хорооллыг бас ингэж урлагч болох юм төсөл хэрэгж очиход бол урам бүтээл чинь зүгээс бол их баяртай байна. Ерөнхийд бол нөгөө гэр гэр хорооллын одоо энэ тогтоц энэ хүмүүсийн одоо энэ аж ахуйн байдлыг төр. Ер нь бол ингээд Hello everyone. Hello everyone and welcome back to the European Spaces of Culture Conference. I'm Shada Islam and I'm your moderator for the final panel today, a panel discussion on the role of culture in the EU's external relations. Now I hope you enjoyed the morning session as much as I did because we looked at six pilot projects from across the world on European Spaces of Culture. We talked about the projects, we looked at their merits and I hope you enjoyed doing that also in this uh, short break that we had. We talked about innovative models of collaboration. We talked about a new spirit of dialogue and we talked about how culture can heal the wounds of uh, conflict and racial and ethnic divisions. We talked about peace and stability, culture and its link to peace and stability. And we talked about human-centered technology. Climate and culture was also a project and a conversation we had. And one of the recommendations that came out of all these discussions was really very simple, that the EU can become a leader in international cultural relations. And that's the topic of our panel discussion today. Let me introduce to you very, very briefly uh, some of our panelists and, of course, our keynote speaker. Mr. Stefano Sanino is Secretary General of the European External Action Service. Hello, Mr. Mr. Sanino, pleasure to see you online. Um, the panelists joining us for this conversation are Salima Yenbu. She's a member of European Parliament from the Green Group. Thank you for joining us, Salima. Pleasure to see you here. Kimani Najugu is a cultural policy expert from Kenya, joining us as well. 
Katerina Botanova is cultural critic and curator. She's a jury member from Ukraine slash Switzerland. And last but not least, we have the pleasure of having with us the UNIC director, Gita Chopka. Uh, there will also be a video intervention by Natalie Tocci, who is the director of the Instituto Afari Internazionale um, and special advisor to Joseph Borrell, who is the EU high representative on foreign policy and security policy. So that is the lineup for today's very interesting conversation. We're going to kick off uh, with a short keynote address from Mr. Salino. So, Stefano, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks for uh, uh, inviting me to, uh, um, uh, to uh, this debate. Um, and I think it's, uh, um, it's extremely important that we can discuss the, uh, um, the, the engagement of the uh, uh, European Union in international cultural, cultural relations in general and in the European space uh, of culture in uh, particular. Um, I understand that this is the last panel of the uh, uh, of the conference today, and so I mean it's uh, always also trying to uh, look at the um, future, looking ahead, and how we can contribute and how can culture contribute to the uh, European Union uh, roles in the in the world. Um, the uh, EIS is a relatively young institution, so we have uh, just celebrated our tenth birthday uh, uh, a few months ago. And uh, as such, is still a relatively young player in uh, external action. And this is even more true when it comes to the international cultural relations. Um, I'm saying this because while uh, in member states the uh, uh, cultural diplomacy has long been uh, an established and, and valuable component of the uh, diplomatic toolbox, for us, for the EIS, this is a relatively uh, more uh, a recent uh, acquisition. And we are still, uh, let's say, uh, uh, in the process of trying to shape up and develop better the work that we can do in this sector and how we can uh, uh, create, in this case, too, a Team uh, Europe spirit, bringing together all the different elements, different components that we have at our disposal. Um, I think that uh, um, one has to, uh, uh, to stress the fact that the, the, the recent developments um, have increased the relevance of um, uh, culture in the uh, uh, EU external action. I'm referring in particular to, um, um, let's say, the, uh, I would say the, the, the models which are uh, competing uh, uh, among, among them. Um, in the, 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 the democratic, it is the autocratic, but also um, this the approach that uh, we are having in our own societies, uh, the polarization and uh, from all points of view, a political culture that we are uh, um, going through and the uh, uh, different narratives uh, around the uh, main uh, uh, issues of our political agenda. And from that point of view, uh, the cultural dimension can be extremely important to uh, um, uh, let's say, overcome this, uh, uh, these differences, to reduce the level of polarization, and also to uh, uh, take part, and one has to be, uh, uh, let's say, direct in this, in the idea of the uh, narratives that are being developed, because I think that we have also a, a, a very positive story to tell. And it is the story of our cultural diversity. It's the story about who we are, I mean, in terms of, uh, of diversity, in terms of openness, um, and what we do in terms of also of using these instruments in support of our key foreign policy objectives. Um, and I'm thinking about the strengthening of multilateralism, which is a, a key for uh, um, our uh, action, but also the support to, the, uh, to human rights, to democracy, and to freedom of expression. And I think that we cannot uh, um, uh, forget, especially in, in, in these days, that the um, forced uh, um, landing of the plane and the arrest of the uh, uh, of Brown and the uh, the uh, um, uh, Belarusian journalist is has been done on the basis of a denial of his freedom of expression. So uh, now more than ever, it is important to uh, uh, to make this uh, this point. Um, uh, let me make just three uh, uh, observations in, in this context. First of all, uh, about the link between uh, uh, culture and uh, sustainable development. Uh, I mean, it's the um, um, 
it's very well clear that uh, uh, sustainable development uh, is a, a key priority for uh, uh, the von der Leyen Commission for, uh, and for the agenda of the European Union uh, as a whole. It's not only uh, um, on the Commission side. Um, Culture, uh, from that point of view, is a vector for change and uh, a change agent also when it comes to the uh, thinking of behavior of the people. So uh, um, um, this calls for uh, increasing our activity in, in this sector to sharpen uh, um, uh, the sensitivity. Um, I think that um, uh, from that point of view, the younger generations are much more aware of this than, uh, uh, than us. Um, but it's important that we uh, continue working uh, uh, intensively on, uh, on this point. Uh, also because the, the, there are several elements, because there is the uh, climate change, but there's also the uh, biodiversity loss. And from that point of view, there is still a lot of work that needs to be done uh, in order to uh, raise the sensitivity on on, uh, on uh, the risk of biodiversity loss. And then the, uh, the, the, the other problem of the uh, um, use of, of the resources. I mean, we all know that uh, um, we use much more resources than the planet is able to, uh, uh, to reproduce. So all, from all that point, these are all elements that should be very much part of, uh, of our activity. Um, the uh, second point is about, and I was mentioning that before, the so-called authoritarian dimension or the authoritarian challenge that is uh, calling for uh, uh, creating new uh, um, uh, cultural bridges. Uh, but also to, uh, uh, to tell our story. I mean, unfortunately, and I mean, again, I'm referring to uh, um, relatively recent events in the battle of narratives about, for example, vaccination. Uh, um, um, the uh, authoritarian regimes have uh, almost made the point of being more effective in uh, um, uh, facing the challenges and uh, the threats of the COVID and in general of the threats to the society against, uh, let's say, our um, slowness uh, in uh, uh, producing results and, and responses. But as a matter of fact, we see that I would say uh, uh, our work, I mean, our narrative and our action has been much more convincing. And uh, now we have been able uh, to uh, uh, deploy um, a, uh, uh, and roll out vaccine schemes. Uh, uh, we have continued uh, exporting uh, vaccines all over the world. We have supported the, uh, the COVAX scheme. We are supporting uh, um, vaccine uh, uh, redistribution uh, in, uh, in different countries. And we are working on a number of other initiatives, including how to enhance the capacity production in the pharmaceutical sector in, uh, uh, in other continents. All that to say that it is important to, uh, to, say, to create awareness on, uh, um, on, uh, on this. And we need to uh, generate uh, um, capacity to uh, um, uh, stress the importance in, in, in of our way of thinking and our way of uh, uh, um, of producing results uh, and the political results. Um, there is one element which is also um, uh, important to uh, mention in this context, and that the. Uh, uh, the new culture-based approaches help dealing with the, uh, the colonial past. And the question of how to deal with the uh, cultural heritage from uh, uh, colonial contexts uh, uh, is uh, something that has, uh, especially in the collections of European uh, Ethnological Museum, has gained momentum. We know that the returns uh, uh, or restitutions of cultural properties fall within the exclusive competence of, uh, of member states. But dialogue, capacity building, cooperation, especially with African countries, could in the long run be fostered at the European level. Um, there is a final element that I want to, uh, um, uh, to mention and I want to stress. Culture is also a very important vector for economic development. And uh, um, we have to be able to uh, uh, integrate the uh, culture into the, uh, uh, the economic dimension much more. And, and this can uh, be a factor that is generating uh, um, uh, growth in, uh, um, in the world, and especially in, uh, in, in countries that need to uh, um, find new ways of uh, um, being part of the uh, economic uh, um, scenario. Um, 
So on the basis of all this consideration, I believe that the European Union and the External Action Service needs to strengthen the dimension of international cultural relations. Um, I'm not. Uh, um, I'm not saying that this is going to uh, to be easy. We are in a constant struggle uh, um, on about budgets, about resources, uh, about doing more with less. Um, I, uh, especially in my new capacity, understand that there are limits to what you can do more with less because <laughs> it's the uh, there are many competing priorities and a relatively uh, a limited uh, um, um, amount of resources available. But again, we want to uh, uh, invest uh, in in this area. And I hope that you will see also some clear indications in the redefinition of the structure of VIS, which is now coming to fruition, I hope, in the, in the, in the next few weeks. Um, European spaces of culture with the aim to develop an innovative pattern of co-creation are a, a, an important uh, uh, element of the, our toolbox. Um, um, the new European Bauhaus uh, uh, with its uh, uh, different working methods uh, used until, until, up until now um, is also um, a very relevant example from, uh, from that point of view. And I hope that um, um, we can uh, uh, create uh, new spaces for exchanges and discussion um, uh, starting already in uh, the uh, design phase. Um, so I will um, I will stop it uh, stop it there. Um, but uh, again, I want to uh, uh, stress once again the importance for all these uh, reasons of the uh, uh, development of our uh, international cultural dimension. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Sanino. You've really given us a very complete picture of culture in international relations, making a very valid point that for the EU per se, it's rather a new field. This has been uh, a member state prerogative so far, so really a work in progress for the European External Action Service, uh, but also saying that the relevance of culture, especially in this pandemic times, has increased uh, the need to reduce polarization, values of human rights, democracy, and freedom of expression, and linking culture as you've done to sustainable development goals, but also making the point, a very important point of its credibility and relevance for younger, younger people, climate change and biodiversity as well, and the link to jobs and growth, economic development. But I have a quick follow-up question for you. Given that all these priorities and very valid priorities you've made, if you were to give, be given a choice of making one judgment, one selecting one priority as being the important one that you would focus on going forward in international cultural relations from the EU perspective, what would you identify? What would you pinpoint? <laughs> That's a, um, a difficult choice to make. Huh? Um, um, I would say that the, uh, uh, the, uh, the focus on uh, freedom of expression, uh, um, it's the, uh, maybe the central one, because starting from that, then we can uh, um, broaden the scope to all other areas and then encompass all the other elements. But if we do not, I would say, uh, focusing on freedom of expressions, all the rest will fall apart. So uh, um, um, let's go to the fundamentals and to the basic first, and then we develop all the rest. Thank you very much, Mr. Serino. A wise choice, if I may just say so. Thank you, and I hope to see you again very soon. Take care. Let's turn now to a video from Natalie Tocci. Uh, as I said, she's the special advisor to Joseph Borrell, the EU High Representative for Foreign and Security Policy. Let's play the video, please, now. Hello everyone, it's a real pleasure to be with you all here virtually uh, at this high level conference organized by the EU National Institutes for Culture. Now, uh, indeed, uh, looking at the role of uh, culture in, in the EU's external action really brings us to a wider reflection about uh, the way in which European foreign policy is more broadly uh, conceived and it, as it has been construed, if you like, over, over the years. I mean, in a sense, if you think about it, and, and different terms have been uh, used over, <clears throat> over the years, um, the idea of uh, Europe's external action, of European foreign policy, uh, as being uh, a foreign policy which has been, over the years, 
defined as comprehensive, as integrated, uh, as being joined up, or at least having the ambition of being comprehensive, joined up, uh, and, and integrated, uh, really speaks about a foreign policy which is understood as bringing together different policy fields, uh, so from trade to development to security, uh, to uh, research, to infrastructure, to digital energy, climate, and of course, uh, crucially, culture as well, as well as being a foreign policy in which uh, the supranational level, of course, coexists with the national level. So the idea of comprehensive, a joined up, uh, an integrated uh, foreign policy uh, in which both at supranational level and at national level, different po po policy fields uh, coexist. Uh, of which, obviously, culture uh, is, uh, is is a key one in, in this respect. So uh, going, in a sense, a little bit more, more deeply into why culture and cultural policy uh, have uh, emerged, in a sense, have re-emerged uh, as, as key themes in European foreign policy, um, I think it's important to put the spotlight uh, onto another key notion, which has really uh, emerged as being uh, a dominant notion, in a sense, both uh, concerning European foreign policy, as well as the way in which the European Union is internally understood. And this is the notion of resilience. Uh, now, re resilience has really kind of emerged as a key theme, initially when we were talking about, um, you know, in, in the foreign policy fields, when we were talking about fragile countries, particularly uh, in our neighbourhood, uh, be it to the east uh, or be it to the south. Uh, and the idea that the fragilities and the vulnerabilities uh, across, again, different policy spheres required a resilience building approach uh, in which culture uh, played a prominent role. Uh, so this is something, in a sense, that beginning in 2014, 2015, started becoming fairly widespread. But what's interesting about this notion is that now we talk about resilience even when we talk internally uh, about the European Union. So the idea that resilience building is also something uh, that applies uh, internally to the European Union itself. The idea of being able to respond and adapt to crises, to shocks, to bounce back basically after a shock or a crisis as indeed uh, we're obviously living through now over the course of uh, the pandemic. So precisely how is it that culture plays, plays a role in all of this? Um, now, beyond being obviously a policy area in and of itself, uh, I think what is key about uh, culture and cultural policy is that it interacts crucially, and this is why the integrated or comprehensive approach or the joined up approach is, is so important, it interacts with other sectors, with other policy spheres. So, for example, if we're thinking about uh, health, uh, you know, in the course of this pandemic, obviously, uh, health policy uh, has been uh, a key aspect. Well, very clearly, um, when it comes to public health, uh, culture has a, a key role to play. Culture, particularly if understood uh, as being obviously intimately connected with information and education. If one thinks about all of the practices uh, that one has sort of learned, if you like, uh, over the course of uh, this pandemic, from, from, from social distancing to, to in general, if you like. Um, yeah, I mean, sort of readying ourselves up to completely different uh, lifestyles, culture obviously has been a key element, if you like, of, of our resilience as individuals and, and, and as communities. I think equally important uh, is the idea of, of economic resilience and how uh, culture uh, plays a key role in this respect. Uh, we only need to think, for instance, about the role uh, that the creative industries uh, are playing and will be playing uh, in the revamping, in the reignition, reignition uh, of our European economies uh, uh, after this, uh, this pandemic. And then, of course, and perhaps this is the most crucial of all, the idea of, of, of political resilience. And political re resilience understood also uh, as a resilience that really puts at the heart uh, notions uh, like, obviously, political participation and human rights uh, and rule of law. And the, the fundamental role that culture plays uh, in consolidating and spreading uh, and deepening many of these values uh, across different forms, you know, be it uh, through, uh, through art, be it through education. So, of course, you know, the, the fascinating aspect about culture is the way in which uh, it obviously filters through uh, across different spheres, as I said, from information uh, to, to education, uh, to, to art, uh, entertainment. 
So uh, in all of this, and, and to sort of conclude, uh, how is it also that uh, culture plays out in, in terms of the, you know, how is it that one promotes uh, resilience, uh, be it internally within the union and above all externally through our, our external action uh, by integrating, if you, if you like, in our, in our foreign policies more, more traditionally, if you like, understood. Um, well, very clearly, there is a bilateral element to this. Um, so the way in which culture and cultural policy uh, need to feature increasingly prominently in the bilateral relations, in the sort of state-to-state uh, -state relations, if you like, with, with third countries. Uh, an integrated approach, a comprehensive approach, a joined-up approach, at the end of the day, mean, mean this, mean that when the European Union has its uh, relations with anyone, uh, anyone per third country, uh, it is not simply uh, a conversation uh, about security or about development or about trade, uh, but culture has to feature prominently, if you like, in the construction of that, that relationship. Uh, secondly, of course, it's the, related, it's the way in which the European Union does policy with the non-state level, uh, and therefore the direct promotion of culture uh, through uh, relations and engagement and support for civil society externally in, uh, in the Union. Uh, and then, of course, there is the third uh, dominant uh, aspect, if you like, of European foreign policy, which is intimately connected, if you like, to the very core uh, of the EU's uh, interests, which is, of course, multilateralism and global governance. And so ensuring, and of course, the UNESCO uh, is the first, but not the only, uh, port of call, um, it is key that uh, in its support for multilateralism and global governance, uh, culture features prominently both by directly supporting those international organizations that deal with culture, but also ensuring that even in other multilateral uh, organizations, culture is increasingly mainstreamed, if you like, in their respective fields of work. That was Natalie Tocci joining us from Italy and giving her, us her perspectives on culture and EU's external relations. Now, let me turn to Salima Yenbu, the member of European Parliament from the Green Group. Uh, Salima, you will be speaking in French, but I'm going to put the question to you in English. So given the global landscape and the challenges that Mr. Salino has referred to, how do you think that the European Union, European Union member states and civil society actors can work together to put culture at the core of uh, external policies? Salima, the screen's yours. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci à thank Unique. you very much. Thank you for UNIT. Thank you to UNIT for this conference and thank you for this invitation. So I will try to be general and then um, I will talk uh, into more detail to answer the question. So culture is essential and we need to add culture to, to the agenda, especially after this pandemic. In fact, the post-COVID world does depend on culture. I am MEP since 2019, so this is my first uh, mandate, but I'm also a member of the CUPE and I'm a part of the Green Party, but I'm also the member of the Foreign Affairs Commissions and Human Rights. And so I also defend culture uh, since the beginning of my term. And so the European Spaces of Culture Initiative was initi initiated by my group, the Green Party. And so I want to make sure that uh, the cultural relations and uh, that uh, cultural actions can develop in the future. Since 2011, we've had debates, uh, communications, resolutions, uh, and uh, we had a common a joint report in 2017. And this is an important reference because it asks for a change of paradigms in cultural relations. For example, they ask for an interpersonal relationship in cultural relations. But where are we now? What kind of perspective do we have for international cultural relations? Unfortunately, we still have a lack of cohesion between the EU, EU member states and non-EU member states. 
there has been structures that have been implemented. However, there aren't enough structures within the EEAS. In the networks, I see that there is a lack of internal coordination within the structures of the European Commission. However, the European Parliament since 2019 hasn't been informed on the future of the strategy of 2016 or the cultural agenda of 2018. So I tried to talk about it a few times, but I rarely had an answer from the representatives of the European Commission. I don't know if uh, Mr. Sanino is still there, but I was happy to see him there. And so I hope that uh, he will give us some keys to reinforce our cultural relations. On my side, I worked on my role as the coordinator of the CUPE. And uh, so I really tried to give a new impetus on the parliamentary debate on this subject. And we will have this debate in August. And I really hope that Mr. Sanino and Mr. Burrell will participate. We will try to create a new political framework post uh, after the pandemic. Now, to focus on your question, so how can we implement culture in external action? Well, we need to um, make the civil societies participate. When I talk with the civil society outside the European Union, for example, in the South Mediterranean or in Africa, I realized that the programs uh, with European funds did not meet the needs of local programs. And uh, they often worked on issues such as migration, counterterrorism, and so it is impossible to create equitable partnerships if our work on cultural diplomacy only focuses on our policies and does not take into account the needs of our collaborators. And so this is why. And so here I'm giving you a proposal of collaboration with the Commission. I suggested a new pilot project, a new permanent forum, which gets together the uh, U uh, EU, the um, cultural stakeholders of uh, the EU member states and the uh, cultural members of uh, EU member states outside of the EU. This uh, collaboration will enable us to create recommendations. Now, this is still a project, it's a proposal, and it's still we're still waiting for the assessment of the European Commission, but I really hope that this is a project which will work. It is essential to reinforce collaborations outside of Europe, to reinforce um, global cultural relations, but to also foster uh, working relationships with our partners. Finally, um, what about uh, the preparatory actions of uh, the cultural houses, which is the initiative of uh, the European Parliament? The European Parliament doesn't have uh, the... Um, um, the right to decide on the funds, but we can. We need to collaborate with the European Commission so that we can still have uh, financing. So we, the idea is to really launch new initiatives to work on a new projects, and I think that the conference today really helped us to go this way. So I'm really looking forward to working with the colleagues from the European Commission to be able to find more solutions within Europe creation, for instance. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Salima. ...about how to go forward. You've uh, said that the focus on culture in the European Union policies is not yet strong enough. Uh, you've talked about the need for more inter-institutional cooperation on this issue. And you've said there will be a joint meeting soon of the Cultural Committee and the External Relations Committee. And a very important point, Salima, that you've made is that we should also listen to our partners and their needs and their concerns when it comes to the notion and the concept of culture in uh, international relations. You've asked for the creation establishment of a permanent forum, uh, which frankly I think is a great idea. 
And you said you're ready to work with the uh, European Union uh, Commission and other uh, institutions in taking this uh, preparatory action forward. So some very, very good practical ideas there as well about taking this uh, cultural relations uh, story forward. Thank you, Selima. Let me turn now to Kimani Nojugu, a cultural expert from Kenya. Uh, Kimani, uh, welcome. Great to have you here. Tell us from your point of view as the cultural policy expert, what do you think is important when the EU defines its cultural relations policy, especially when you're looking at the European spaces of culture? And are we listening, a point that Salima made, are we listening and learning enough from our, our partners across the world? Screen's yours, Kimani. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, talk about this very important um, topic. Um, and the, you know, on the role of culture in the future of European Union external uh, action. I think that we are agreed um, that culture is really central to the European Union, Union external uh, relations. And if that is the case, if we are all agreed that that is the case, then it is imperative that platforms and initiatives, such as the European spaces of culture, are supported deliberately, pointedly, and sustainably because of the, of the work that they do. Now, at the center of that work is really increasing global understanding and global um, um, sharing of human values. Notice that I'm, I'm talking about human values, not European values, but really human, um, human values um, in a very inclusive and integrated manner. Uh, the platforms uh, that we have for culture really do show us the particularities and uniqueness of our communities, even as they um, enhance you know, our collective human condition that our diversity is not a problem really, but an asset that we can tap on to advance humanity. So what should the cultural policy, uh, the cultural um, relations policy of the European Union be looking at? In my view, the first thing that they need to be able to look at is the recognition of culture and the various ways in which it is expressed, such as through the arts, as enablers in our effort to create a more humane, peaceful, and secure world. So the first point of departure is really the recognition of this possibility of culture to create a humane, peaceful, and secure world. Therefore, the deliberate utilization and strategic utilization of cultural and creative industries. And here I'm talking about industries in their entirety, you know, industries that are um, activated by the, the imagination and, and, and innovation, um, such as, of course, performing arts, visual arts, audiovisual media, design, and so forth and so on, which collectively lead to the creative economy that those, you know, um, assets that we have, um, do contribute to the promotion of, of, um, of, of human rights, freedom of expression, gender equality, and so forth. Especially because culture functions in a transversal manner. You know, it, culture transversally engages every aspect of our lives. It engages gender, it engages climate change, it engages human rights, it engages the ways in which uh, we interact uh, with, it, with each other. Therefore, the transversal nature of, 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 of culture um, ensures that our development is more inclusive, it's more humane, and so on. And I just also want to point to another idea that we really do need to pay attention to. And this is the idea of culture and the creative industries as um, capable of creating jobs, creating employment, enhancing, you know, our lives, especially in, in the global South. 
you know, if, if you look at the opportunities that um, uh, culture and, and, and the creative industries have, um, in, in te- especially with regard to digital technology um, and the content creation and the ways in which they engage with the tourism and so forth, um, we do see an opportunity here to invest in a very, very uh, uh, deliberate way to minimize the global inequalities through uh, access to finance, access to markets, access to, con- to technologies, um, and, and, and so on. Of course, that has to be done through um, you know, innovative policy formulation. It has to be very innovative. Um, we have to innovatively and collectively come up with policies that kind of um, take care of not just the global north, but also the global south, if we are committed to equality uh, globally. The third consideration, in my view, that the European Union needs to take into account is the fact that, um, you know, culture um, is really central to the transmission of values and that our universal values find expression at the local level. So that when we are doing advocacy, for example, on issues of gender equality, the, uh, that advocacy ought to be situated in the cultural sphere in which they will be played. Uh, they will be played out, and 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 therefore it's 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 um uh, that culture itself is active at the local level as a point of advocacy. So that even when we are dealing with issues of climate climate change and climate mitigation, we do that through a cultural lens. You know, we do that through a cultural lens. And I think that this is something that the European Union does need to pay particular um, attention to. The navigation of community structures and values, we know can be quite slow and arduous, can be quite difficult. And yet it is inevitable that we follow that, that trajectory, follow that path of engagement. Um, it requires internal dialogue with existing cultural institutions, with existing networks in the community, Um, It calls for patience. Um, It calls for open-mindedness. Now, the other thing that I would like to share with you um, that relates to what we need to be paying attention to is that cultural relations ought to be driven by a philosophical thrust that respects the knowledge and perspectives of other people. It cannot be the case that the European you know, a knowledge system is the only is the only valuable knowledge system. There are valuable, valuable uh, knowledge valuable systems located in other parts of the world, and we need to be learning from those knowledge systems. We need to be learning from indigenous knowledge systems or even contemporary knowledge systems that are growing from the global south. That means, therefore, that a progressive cultural policy a progressive cultural relations policy located in the global north must be a learning policy. It cannot assume that it has reached its optimum. Now, I want to point to the fifth, um, and I and I, I suspect this is my last point of consideration, and that is the utilization of existing policy contexts and mechanisms located in the global south. That indeed that there there do exist in the global south certain systems, certain mechanisms, certain institutions, certain networks and movements, whether they are women's movements, youth movements, art collectives and so forth, that actually do um, uh, play a role in the transformation of their their societies and communities. And for example, the European, uh, the African Union um, this year, there is a declaration that this year is Africa's year for arts, culture, and heritage. And of course, one would want to ask the question, how is the European Union cultural policy responding to this position that has been taken at the continental level by African leaders? Equally in contexts such as Kenya, through the work of civil society organizations, many of us pushed for culture to be integrated in the national constitution culture specifically as as the foundation of the nation of Kenya. 
To what extent is the European Union tapping on this very strategic work that has been done by Kenyans to integrate culture in the national constitution? And not just culture, artistic freedom protected alongside academic freedom, alongside other freedoms, you know, artistic freedom um, as again articulated in the national constitution. To what extent is this innovation coming from the global south being tapped on by the global north? I think this is, this is really key. And for me, this is Thank what you. Ubuntu is all about. We need to be able to be doing more. Are you listening enough? I don't think you're listening enough. I think that you need to be learning institutions, you need to be listening more to local knowledges, local situatedness. And when we do that, when we learn together, uh, we learn from you and you learn from us, we will be able to become more humane worlds, a more, a, a more humane world, we'll build a more equitable societies and more equitable communities and a more caring world that takes care of all of us. I think that's about it uh, in terms of what I would like to say. I can say more, but that's about it for now. Thank you so much, uh, Kimani. You've said some very important things. And in fact, uh, because we have the pleasure of having Mr. Sanino with us still, and you've asked some very relevant questions to Mr. Sanino about how much or how little the EU is paying attention to what's happening inside the African Union, inside Kenya, on questions of creative industries and culture and international relations. And also you've had uh, Salima talk to, talk to us about how she's a little uneasy about the state of progress, space of progress on cultural relations. So Mr. Sinino, if you'd like to just come in very quickly on these two points, and then I'll move on to Katerina Botanova. Screen's yours, Mr. Sinino. Thank you very much. Yes, with pleasure. And I mean, um, starting with the uh, um, the point of uh, how to uh, make more relevant the uh, um, uh, the cultural dimension, I think that uh, bringing together um, the cultural and asset uh, is a very good idea. I think that you are right in terms of enhancing the interinstitutional dimension. Um, we need also to uh, how to say uh, to make it sure because we cannot do things if we do not have also member states with us. I mean, at the end of the day, it's in, it's absolutely essential that uh, um, that they are with us. That's why I'm speaking about the Team Europe approach, and that then links me to uh, the point that Nani was making, and I cannot agree more. We cannot do things only unilaterally. I mean, essentially exporting our cultural model, but we have to make and, and create interaction between. Uh, uh, the, the different cultures eh, and the different models that uh, that we have. Um, this is in general, I mean, I could say that it should be uh, uh, applicable also at the broader level, and it's what we are trying to do in, the, in the establishing a new partnership with the African Union and with the African countries to uh, that is not only based on a sort of a, a support coming from the European side towards Africa, but on the contrary, co-creating a, a common space um, and co-managing uh, the, uh, uh, these processes. Um, and one final point that I wanted to make, because I think it's very uh, interesting, and you were taking also one part that I was making about the economic impact of culture. And if I may, we should go even beyond simply the, uh, the idea of cultural industry. Eh? Because, I mean, uh, we are interpreting culture in a sort of, uh, and we have to interpret the culture in a much broader perspective, a much broader sense, which is not only the purely, let's say, um, um, book, uh, books, uh, cinemas, theater, uh, opera, or uh, but let's say the, the 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 cultural dimension of our societies, and that includes many other areas, eh? and can include fashion, or can include um, uh, food, and can include um, um, I don't know wine, uh, can include many things. Um, and if we can put together all these different different elements, we can create a much more integrating concept, which is uh, uh, also more helpful from the uh, from the economic point of view. That's also what I have in mind when I'm thinking about how to develop an economic dimension for the uh, um, for yeah. let's say our cultural space. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sinino. Indeed, uh, the concept of culture, the definition of culture is now very, very wide and very relevant and credible in today's moment. So thank you very much for discussing that and for responding to some of the, let's say, unease that existed in some uh, quarters about how the external action service will proceed in actually listening to partners. Uh, let me turn now, thank you very much. So let me turn now to Katerina Botanova. 
Um, uh, I have a, yeah, okay, Salima, you want to come in very, very quickly to in response to what Mr. Salina has said. Yes, I'm giving you the screen for a minute. No, but... Merci. Pas forcément, Monsieur Sanino, mais. Uh... Thank you. No, I, I didn't really want to react to Mr. Sanino, but I wanted to uh, pinpoint uh, the cooperation which we talked about before. So it's really important to define what a cooperation is. We work equal to e equal. So there's not a professor and a learner. We talk uh, about multilateral collaboration um, and uh, something that is useful for both parties. And um, so I think it would be a mistake to be in competition with uh, our global south or other countries. For instance, China, uh, for instance, is uh, working on its cultural relations, relations with uh, other countries. However, uh, China has a hidden agenda because it's a propaganda of uh, the Communist Party. And so I think we need to be there too, um, to be able to develop uh, cultural diplomacy to share our humanist values and uh, to offer something other than the Chinese perspective. Of equality, and that's exactly what I want to talk to Katerina Botanova about, because that's a, that's a question that's been coming up throughout the day, is actually being equal partners, just co-creating, working together, collaboration in the real sense of the word, not one side doing more than the other. And I think um, Mr. Kimani has, of course, brought in that very, very forcefully and very powerfully as well. So from your point of view, uh, the originality of the European spaces of culture has been listening and working together and the question of equality. Your your, your views, please, Katerina. Screen, screen to yours. Thank you, Shada. Um, the point of, you know, talking equal to equal is fantastic. And I'm really happy to hear that it's becoming a more and more of a um, mainstream of discussion uh, about cultural relations. But my thought there was that it's uh, quite crucial to remember when we, you know, talk about equality and participation, talk about uh, equality in decision making and mutual learning, that we don't forget that um, we still talk about the structural inequality. We still live in the world uh, with inequality of resources, of uh, decision-making powers, uh, of subjectivity. With all the best intentions and all the, the political wishes to be equal, we're still largely living in, um, you know, we can call it Western, we can call it Northern, although I think it's more or less the same thing. So Western dominated and uh, quite a male world, uh, which does need a careful, but very persistent and very consecutive decolonization. And I think that in our case, uh, decolonization means accepting and appreciating this multiple cultural and social models existing around the globe. I really like what Kimani said about um, universal values existing and being realized on the local level. Um, for example, and you know, it's what I see very much in my field of work, um, when we talk about a culture for community building and empowerment or art as, a, as an activism, as an active position, those points became um, actively debated within a European Union by and large only after 1989-91 when different models of coexistence between political and cultural realms became visible uh, when Eastern Europe became visible for European Union. However, Outside the EU and basically everywhere where we can see uh, what used to be called developing or transitional, but I do prefer to call it turbulent or insecure, or often violent forms of a political decision making and a conflictual social contracts. Culture is a milieu for both supporting and sustaining communities and for formulating quite active and strong political positions. What it means when we talk about the forms collaboration, and since we're coming now more from a general policy issues to the project of spaces, uh, what does it mean for project like that? And I was thinking that uh, maybe it does mean that the usual forms of collaborations, what is usually being supported by um, EU programs, you know, festivals, biennials, uh, showcases, 
but also what was also discussed today, you know, jobs creation, capacity building, maybe this needs to, in a certain way, step down and free a space um, for multiple different uh, durational and process-based collaborative formats. Because only through durational and process-based formats um, can this mutual learning take space. This is not something which can happen in the moment, which is not something which can happen uh, in a very short time. Um, and another important point for me when we talk about uh, you know, cultural relations and about the quality is that uh, cultural actors globally quite often work not just in a very precarious, but also very dangerous circumstances, often with a danger to their lives. Um, look at Brazil nowadays, look at Colombia and Peru, to um, name a few examples outside of Europe, but also look at Poland or Hungary, you know, within Europe. That's uh, quite a situation. And in this circumstances, partnerships can be unstable and volatile, and decision-making can be uh, non-consecutive and disruptive. And I think it's important to remember that this requires very open and open-minded, uh, flexible, careful and caring. I do like the word caring, by the way, when we talk about culture, caring approach to cultural relations. And I'm quite happy um, as a former jury member of the Spaces Project to say that I think that's exactly what the Spaces Project um, was striving for and actually did demonstrate. Thank you very much, uh, Katerina. Making a very, very strong point, I thought, towards the end as well about uh, the uh, precarious and fragile conditions under which many cultural actors uh, live uh, outside Europe, but also within Europe. It's a very important point to have a caring approach, as you said. So thank you, Katerina. Let me move now to Gita. So Gita, European spaces of culture, we've talked about it all day. We've sort of identified what makes it very different, very special. So I'd like to get some of your opinion, being director of UNIC, how you see this going forward and what are the lessons you think you've learned from this experience? Thanks, Shada. And thanks uh, everyone for being here and joining um, us on this uh, conference where we're bringing together the learnings from these pilot projects uh, that have been happening on the ground. Um, as part of um, the European spaces of culture. Um, just yesterday, I was sitting in the, um, where I was giving a lecture at the Vienna Diplomatic Academy about EU cultural relations. And one of my slides was saying, um, culture has to be part and parcel of our foreign policy, which is a statement of the former HRVP Federica Mogherini in 2016, when the uh, strategy on international cultural relations was first published. Culture has to be part and parcel of our foreign policy. Culture is a powerful tool to build bridges between people. This is why cultural diplomacy must be at the core of our relationship with today's world. And it's great to, to look back um, at these five years of work that has been done since then. And I would like to remind us all that we are a step closer into making culture one of the pillars of the EU's action in the world because we've gathered the experiences of one of the key programs that um, implements this strategy and also the new agenda for culture. Even though we have learned that there more could be done and that more efforts are desired by certain actors, and we're very happy to also have the European Parliament uh, represented here today with uh, Salima Yanbu. Um, so what have we done overall with these six pilot projects? We have identified a powerful model for the cultural relations of the EU to continue. We see this European spaces of culture as a model. And it's based on the principles of cultural relations as outlined in the strategy. Um, the principles are mutual listening and learning, reciprocity, dialogue, partnership, bottom-up approach. And, you know, it's not that we just started working with this approach in the last five years, but um, our most seasoned and oldest members um, has allowed this um, approach to prosper and gain the trust of partners worldwide. And what we've learned now is that it works even better in the multilateral European uh, setting when we as Europeans work together. This is what we mean when we say EU National Institutes for Culture. At the same time, we look at us as a platform. We're enabling encounters and thereby creating trust and understanding through culture. We're striving to do that. Um, and we can also say that uh, now with the U European spaces of culture that this model is working or that this approach is working. 
you asked about what I learned. I think two, two things that stood out for me when we talked to the colleagues on the ground who have um, spent an immen immense amount of um, work and energy on making these projects come to fruition. And two items stood out. One was the marvelous experience that colleagues described regarding the kind of creativity an open space of creation and collaboration can set free. This was clearly defined um, or described as something new on the EU side, and the value of this was clear to all participants. Second, for our partners on the ground, we have heard this strongly from the work in Sri Lanka and in the US to very different countries that the values the EU represents are seen and valued and they're shared. And I think this is what Kimani also uh, was uh, saying when he said these are human values or these are global values. We fully, I mean, we, we couldn't agree more. And I think that the fact that our partners in such different countries as the US and Sri Lanka express the same thought shows the potential of the model of European spaces of culture on a geopolitical stage. It's extremely versatile as the activities are based on the local context. I hear from our colleagues, Katarina and Kimani, that maybe we're not always 100% successful. That's true, this is a learning process, and I think we're on the right track, um, and that these projects or these activities bring us forward in that regard. Because the idea is that, uh, that um, these projects are listening to the, are developed together with local partners and, um, and yeah, implemented together as well. And so in the best of the scenarios, we live the values that the EU stands for rather than showcasing them or uh, telling our colleagues that we have certain values. And this is this famous shift of, from cultural diplomacy from a traditional approach to a cultural relations approach that Julia highlighted also this morning when she presented the policy recommendations. And what then can also happen is that, um, I mean, this is a bit our role. We always have to, you know, as EU National Institutes for Culture, we are trying to bridge um, the worlds of policymakers, academics, but, and practitioners, and our colleagues on the ground. And so it's sometimes a bit of a balance act between recognizing the political needs um, with what our partners are finding important on the ground. And as we're doing this, you know, as in a reference to policymakers, we can tackle the EU priorities through culture. We've heard it's a it's a versat it's versatile, it's a vector for so many different aspects. And it can also work for peace and security. You know, even though, I mean, Katarina mentioned, or Kimani, um, that this can also sometimes look as very instrumentalizing, but if done with the model of European spaces of culture, culture can enable the expression and dialogue, foster collaboration and a sense of community. It can help deal with trauma, provide opportunities for inclusive de development, and so much more. Maybe, um, I, I, I do try to be as short as I know we're running a teeny bit late, but we have until 2.30. Um, just about innovation again, because that's also something that we set out to do. We wanted to find innovative models. And to be very frank, we have had, uh, we, we tackled this question from the very beginning. What is innovation? Is it innovation in the arts field um, that satisfies, you know, or that is an, an exhibition that could be shown at the Tate Modern? Or is innovation different wherever you go? What does it mean for our for our project also? And what we defined innovation as, I remember the jury discussions about this as well, Katarina, looking at you. Um, it's a new process of collaboration. It's about the how, it's about the attitude, it's about how we work together and creating these um, equitable um, opportunities and creating equality in this setup, which doesn't necessarily look equal from the start because as the European Union, as EU member states that we represent, and in UNIC together with civil society actors. We do bring the funds for this. Um, and so how can we, um, despite these power relations that we all still under, you know, in our current world, Katarina mentioned this, and also Stefano Sanino mentioned the colonial aspects um, that we're dealing, or post-colonial aspects that we're dealing with today, how can we um, reach uh, equality? And I think the answer lies in the local context. Just as a reminder, you know, the jury picked out five projects because we could only uh, finance five with the amount, uh, with the funds that we had. But actually six projects were implemented because the project in Ethiopia was so convincing to organizations in Ethiopia that they managed to get all their funds uh, from local sources, um, European sources, uh, international um, outlets, and also local partners who gave their expertise and their skills. So I would say, you know, to sum up that we did manage to raise um, 
the uh, EU cultural relations to to the next level, as we as we said in our slogan. But we need we need to raise it to yet another level. We need broader implementation, more flexible and larger budgets, flexible budgets. Um, we don't always need to go huge. You know, we can achieve a lot with the funds, uh, with these projects as they were implemented now. But it, uh, European spaces of culture should become a permanent tool of the EU's external actions. We're very much with Salima on that point. And of course, this was also raised by Julia. And I I mean, these, um, these activities that have happened in more than six countries now in six regions, they were extremely, they, they had an impact. They, they achieved something and they should continue. And this is something that we need to build into the European spaces of culture, that this is not a one-off activity, but that this can continue. Um, so yeah, uh, Julia also said that the EU can take the lead in international cultural relations because no other region of the world is fostering this approach and let's fill this with activities, with more cooperation, um, with more listening and learning and more joint um, implementation in this multilateral approach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gita. Indeed, not shouldn't be a one-off. It should be a permanent tool for the European Union and its external relations. Well, one very, very quick uh, question to all of you, but really, really good brief answers, if I may. I'm going to start with you. And the question uh, for all of you is, what is the one thing that you would like to change immediately in our cultural relations so that we can build this uh, world of equality and partnership and trust that we've all talked about? So I'm going to turn to you first, Mr. Sanino, in 30 seconds or so, what's the one thing you would like to change immediately as you lead us into this new era of cultural diplomacy, cultural relations rather than diplomacy? Um, 30 seconds. Um, I suppose uh, the... Uh, uh, I would like to uh, to, to uh, take out the barriers eh, among ourselves to uh, to generate a, a common ground where we could all all contribute in a way uh, to uh, the development of uh, what I think has been a sort of red thread of this humanitarian uh, uh, humanistic uh, uh, dimension that we have uh, uh, identified. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Selima. For you. The one thing you would change immediately um, in 30 seconds or less. <laughs> so très difficile, il faut renoncer au reste. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a really difficult thing. I would say uh, the sustainability of uh, financing to create an, uh, a viable ecosystem and to have long uh, and structural projects, even without uh, EU funds. Donc pour faire money. You'll have to unmute yourself, Kimani. Yes, yes, I got it. Um, I think that for me, the first thing we have to do is to democratize um, access to technologies um, and um, access to uh, vaccines. I think that the first thing that, um, you know, um, our institutions should be able to do is to push towards fairness in access, especially to the COVID-19 vaccine, and I haven't had enough of that shout from all of us. So that's what I'd like to change. Thank you very much, Kimani. Katerina. Uh, the value of local expertise and uh, the place of local expertise in um, cultural relations. But the most important, I would say, is uh, planning horizons for programs and funding. Extend them to be able to plan and work uh, in a longer stretches of time. I think that's very important for um, all of us. Thank you very much. Gita. Yeah, I think I would want to look at our own network um, of the EU National Institutes for Culture. I think we need to create even more of a habit of working together so that we can also work in an impactful way to, with our local partners on the ground, taking into account all that has been uh, said before. When we look at our budgets, for instance, only 1% is approximately spent on European action, and I think that could easily be 10%. 
Thank you very much indeed to all of you. So final word from me, as, as you know, I'm uh, based in Brussels. I watch European Union foreign policy, security policy, trade development, and the inclusion and diversity agenda. And having listened to this wonderful conference from the beginning, uh, watched how culture, the concept, the definition is becoming wider, more relevant to today's challenges. And listening to how all of you have really interacted with each other, but also on the question of how we can become more equal, how we can work together, innovative ways of collaboration, and also new ways of dialogue. I think, if I may say so, that the one immediate challenge that we have, in a sense, overcome, at least partially, is a change in our mindsets at looking at the world as interdependent, interactive, and interconnected, and not working anymore, as often we've done in the past, really, uh, in silos. So congratulations to all of you. Congratulations to the European Spaces of Culture. And I do wish you all the best in the coming years, because as all of you have said, this should not just be a one-off. This is something that is essential in our toolbox as we move forward in EU external relations. So thank you very much indeed to all of you. I would just say to you that the entire conference, as you know, has been recorded and it will be available on Unix website for all of us to see and to treasure and to learn from. And I'd like to now finally give the floor to Guzman Palacios again. He's the Vice President of UNIC for his closing words. And from me, Shada Islam here in Brussels, thank you everyone for joining us. Guzman, the screen's yours. Well, thank you very much, Shada. Thank you to all of you. Um, I hope you have enjoyed the conference of today. I think it was, it was great hearing from all of you. And um, uh, it's been especially interesting from my point of view. Uh, today we have seen how the still relatively new, given the, that the strategy was adopted five years ago in 2016, EU approach to cultural relations works in practice and that the model of European spaces of culture is viable in creating the desired results. From bringing the worlds of arts and technology together to humanize the debate on technological developments and raising awareness of critical issues such as air pollution, to bringing artists and local communities to work together towards peaceful coexistence, decolonization, gender equality, for example. We have seen that collaboration based on innovative partnerships, co-creation, and a spirit of equality can go far in bringing people together and pressing local issues together via creativity. And that is uh, an approach in Team Europe's external relations to the world that is much needed. One thing that has become clear by shifting through the project outcomes and statements of those involved is that this is an initiative that can truly create trust and understanding, that it brings the EU's relationships with the world forward in a way that is based on mutual listening and learning, creating a dialogue. Through dialogue, we get to know each other, and if we know each other, we are better equipped to create a more peaceful world. And it's not that our aim when we engage with people on a global stage, peace. A lot, however, has still to be done to take this further to make this world on a structural basis. What became clear in the conference today is that uh, we need to continue not only to project European spaces of culture, but the activities on the ground. Uh, that the world needs its implementing a uh, implementing the strategic, uh, strategic approach to cultural relations and that it should become a permanent tool of EU external action. We heard as well that a challenge is achieving true, equal design, delivery and ownership of a project. To that end, Eunique is currently designing a fair, fair collaboration toolkit with the support of six experts from all of four corners of the world. Surveys will be launched and roundtables organized to ask a wide field of factors how this can be achieved. Information on this will be shared via our channels. Do sign up and sign up and participate. We are looking forward uh, to continuing European spaces of culture beyond the current project runtime to further the practice of cultural relations and policy dialogue, aiming all our efforts into making this a steady, normal part of the EU's program, programming. Ideally, we would uh, bundle the engagement and energy of all the EU partnerships beyond its borders and even within. We will continue to test and hone the model of European spaces of culture. Already in two weeks' time, the second call for ideas will be closed. And new initiatives will be selected to test new ways of collaboration in EU cultural relations. 
We are looking forward to new inspiring and innovative projects being implemented in 2022. A third call for ideas will be launched in 2023. After this, we hope to continue with European spaces of culture, hopefully reaching out to even more people and more countries. Please feel free to stick around the conference space. The conference space will be open during the next seven days. Before Corona, we would be enjoying a network uh, lunch or drink at this point. Uh, technological, technological advancements allow us to meet and talk with a much smaller uh, ecological footprint also on this platform. Reach out to your colleagues via the participants panel and set up a one-to-one -one conversation on the spot in Confibo. You also stroll through the virtual exhibition space, which you will find uh, under showrooms. Uh, my thanks go out to our partners, uh, partners DG Education and Culture for, of the European Commission and the European External Action Service in the coordination and implementation of the project so far. Our colleagues in Ethiopia, Central America, USA, West Africa, Sri Lanka, and Mongolia for doing an excellent job in implementing the projects during an ex exceptional time. Our external experts working on the project, on the jury, and, and on research and evaluation. And of course, all guest speakers and moderators today for making it a packed but rewarding conference. And last but not least, the European Spaces of Cultures Project team and the UNIC office in Brussels. Thank you for joining up, and it was an enormous pleasure to have you all here in, uh, with us. Um, see you soon. What I most like about European Spaces of Culture is that they are an absolute eye-opener on the importance of culture in the EU external action. I like their power to create partnerships, their impact on environment, technological progress, social cohesion, security, peace, you name it. I wish them, above all, political recognition and support detrimental for their future growth and success. So a little request to all EU partners, have a good look at the amazing spillover effects of these newly created spaces. They are a point of reference for all our future actions. Let's support them together the best we can. For the future, I wish for the successful continuation and expansion of European spaces of culture. This program gave a lot of valuable impulses to UNIC members to intensify their cooperation worldwide. This gives me hope that through European spaces of culture, we improve our ability to further explore new innovative forms of cooperation in the cultural field around the globe. With its equal partnership and co-creation approach, which is also at the core of the Goethe Institute's work, European Spaces of Culture encourages mutual learning from and listening to local partners. This fosters trust building and is the foundation for developing genuine relationships and common perspectives. The equal partnership approach is not easy. It can be a long process and it requires patience, self-reflection and the willingness to discuss and negotiate with each other. But in my view, it is the only future-proof way, the only way we can and should approach cultural relations in the future. Hi, from Copenhagen. I'm Camilla Mordhorst, director of the Danish Cultural Institute. Our key learnings from European spaces of culture is that small projects are the right way to test ideas, and it is a great way to begin. Small projects have the potential to become larger projects with greater impact. With few resources, you can test the quality of the project, the effect, and the potential. You can find the right partners and improve your network and ability to meet local needs and develop common ideas. In the first round of European Spaces of Culture, we participated with a project in Belarus. This project became the inspiration for the design of a larger EU for culture project, which we will be part of the next four years. European Spaces of Culture provide a platform for new dialogues and mutual inspiration. I hope the program will continue and expand. 
Hello all, my name is Ben Aminat from Ethiopia at Baidawe Project. Ethiopian Spaces of Culture catalyzed the creation process of new collaboration platforms, and it's important for it to continue as experimenting with new means of working together is important for coherent cultural diplomacy. Thank you. It was a great experience for me to create Nogomatra International Eco Art Festival, which involved more than 200 people of different generations, backgrounds, and nationality. I think European spaces of culture built kind of international local community lab where cultures become a language for mutual understanding and tools for collaboration. I highly appreciate this initiative and wish a great success for the future activities. Como todo el proyecto de Dioniso, espero que Triángulo Teatro siga integrando Centroamérica en contextos europeos. Espero que las voces también de Centroamérica se escuchen en otras latitudes y ojalá que se puedan retomar las giras centroamericanas presenciales para que podamos intercambiar entre artistas y conocer las realidades de uno y otro país.